Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey guys, how are ya? Welcome back to another episode. So this episode concludes our quote mini series <laughs> on abuse which really ended up being not so many after all, as I said, I think last week. So this week I have with me activist filmmaker Ginger Gentile, and she made this incredible documentary called Erasing Family, and it's about parental alienation, but really it's also about the dangers of the court system and the family family court system and how complicit it can be in erasing families. The movie is hard to watch from sort of an emotional standpoint, but it's also really important. It's really well done. You get pretty invested in um, the families that Ginger tracks. And it's a really, really, really well done documentary. And, you know, one of the things I want to say about it, too, is that it really does tackle both genders. So this isn't just about, you know, dads being alienated. It's, you know, which is what we hear about a lot. But this film follows families with lots of different configurations. You know, there's a mom who's and a stepmom, and there's a dad and his daughter. I mean, there's just all sorts of configurations. And I think it's really important to watch. So I really hope that after listening to this episode, you'll actually also go and watch the film, because I think it's important from an education standpoint. We have got to be talking about these things. We've got to understand how the the family court system can get its claws into our divorces and cause huge amounts of harm. Without further ado, here is my interview with filmmaker Ginger Gentile. Ginger, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about all of this and especially your film, Erasing Family. So let's start at the beginning. Well, first of all, what inspired you to make this movie? Thank you so much, Kate, for having me on to discuss my documentary that's streaming now, Erasing Family. And uh, it was quite a journey to make Erasing Family because it's there is a long backstory that's actually in the film. But to give you the summary, I am the child of high conflict divorce. And one of the consequences of high conflict divorce is that children as they get older can decide to really limit their contact with both parents. And I feel like this isn't something that's discussed as much as aligning with one parent. And after I graduated college, I moved to Argentina because that was the furthest place in the world I could get away from New York where my parents lived. And they would both come visit me, but I just, it was just so much conflict going on. And when I moved to Argentina, that was a good, like eight or nine years after the divorce happened. Wow. But I just, I just couldn't deal with that. I wanted nothing to do with my family and that included extended family hmm. and either by chance or because that's what I needed to discover. After a few years in Argentina, I met a man. And the first thing that he told me was that he hadn't seen his daughter for six years. And the first thing I thought, like most people is, well, you must have a bad lawyer. I even thought, well, I do legal translations. Let's go down to the courthouse and we'll sort this right out. And with that statement, I began to enter a world of courts, documents, lawyers and orders that don't get followed. And as much as the legal system can differ in Argentina to the United States, it is the same the world over. And since starting to do this work 
talking about families that lose contact between a child and a parent after divorce, often referred to as parental alienation, the stories are the same the world over. This is a pandemic. But at that moment, I didn't know what a big of a pandemic it was. I just knew that the person who I loved was very stressed because he couldn't see his daughter. And there was all these orders saying he could see his daughter and they weren't being followed. And he actually had a very good lawyer who was working pro bono on his case. And that didn't seem to help anything. So with each time they would go to court, they would ask for less and less and less. So it went from shared custody to visitations to please let me see her once a year. Mm -hmm. um, they eventually tried habeas corpus. Uh, which a lot of parents in Argentina were trying and also failed because then the criminal court judge says, well, that's a civil court matter. And this went on uh, for years and I was with him for seven years and we formed a film production company together. We did film production services, directed another movie. And finally I decided to make a movie about what was happening to him, but he was not a character in the film. We tried that. It was just too painful for me to record him. And I discovered all of these dads who couldn't see their kids and there was so much shame around this that they weren't talking about this publicly. And when the film came out in 2014 in Argentina, uh, it, it got a lot of reaction. It was the first film to be censored in Argentina in 20 years. Oh, wow. And people were very surprised to hear that there was an injunction because a lot of the people who worked in the court system, who we interviewed, they see themselves as heroes in their own eyes. And we didn't, there's no voiceover. If you ever see the film is called Erasing Dad, it's on our webpage, it's on YouTube and it has English subtitles. But the reason why is that the people who actively pursue cutting ties between parents and children, they think they're doing the right thing. Mm. But most people, when they see this on a screen, think that what they're doing is quite awful. So they weren't prepared to be perceived as villains when they see themselves as heroes. And it's very important in the court case, no one ever accused us of misrepresenting them, just that in the context we showed them, which is their victims, they look bad. We fought the censorship to the Supreme Court, but everybody wants to see a censored film. And one of the results of this was that it became front page news. A lot of people started to come forward saying they had similar stories. I can't tell you the number of journalists who would interview us. And then afterwards said, I can't say this, but I can see my kids. My cousin can't see his kids. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're, I always say fathers in Argentina is because until we made the film and then after the film, the law was changed, custody automatically went to the mother. In Argentina. So that was like the, de the, the default, right. the legal default, right? The legal default, unless the mother is unfit. And, and it takes a fit. lot to prove. Right. So, so in that film, we even have a case of a mother threatening to kill her child, which she eventually does. And oh. no one, no one did anything about it. No one did anything about it. It's all there in the record. And, but she's the mom. So. Right. And, and then also, I mean, even after she killed her son, you know, they, you know, they asked her, why'd you do it? And she said, uh, to get back at the dad. Like it was, it was very clear cut craziness with all these warning signs that she was in psychiatric institutions and no one did anything. And the, the, all the documentation is, is there. So that's, that's an extreme case. And I don't want these extreme cases to shadow what happens in so many divorces where what we commonly refer to as parental alienation. I want to make very clear, this is a pop cultural term. Uh, you could also call it family bond obstruction, um, attachment, trauma disorder, uh, domestic abuse by proxy, but parental alienation is a set of behaviors that a parent does to damage or destroy the relationship between a child and the parent. And even though the child suffers a lot of consequences, the target of this behavior is to make the other parents suffer because that's what's most precious to them. Now, the case of this mother killing her, her child is very extreme and in a lot of cases, it can be very subtle. And we talk about this in the film, it can be referring to the other parent by their first name with pronouns saying every time the child goes to their house, oh, I'm so lonely without you. I'm sad without you. If you stay with me, I'll do this fun activity with you. Uh, call me if you feel uncomfortable, it's okay. I'll call and check in every hour with you. And then you tell me exactly what happens. And it kind of, it coaxes the child to eventually reject that parent, whether that rejection is in their heart, if they're brainwashed or 
they're, it's a survival mechanism. What children who suffer parental alienation learn is that love is not unconditional, it's conditional. Right. Yes, absolutely. And, and just to be clear, right, they, they align with, they align with the parent who is doing the alienating, right? So the one who's calling and saying, right, and saying, I'll check in with you, right? Because it instills fear that like a child thinks, well, there must be something for me to fear. There must be something wrong with the other parent if that's, you know, if that's what my other mother, what my mother is saying, what my father's saying, whatever. Oh, it's so, um, and I, and I appreciate you saying that these extreme cases don't define what this is, right? So it's, there's a spectrum and there's also a spectrum of, you know, mild, moderate, severe. There are even types of children who suffer from parental alienation. So some are hostages, which means that they don't believe what they're saying, but they know to get with the program or they will suffer consequences. And those consequences could be lack of love, feeling excluded. They could be real consequences like taking away phones, being punished, grounded, uh, physically punished. And then there are the brainwashed children who really believe that. I mean, I'm not going to say what actually they believe on their subconscious level, but they take this, uh, this doctrine as, as truth. And kids might switch back and forth and also siblings might react very differently, which to fast forward to the Erasing Family documentary, which I started when I moved back to the U.S. in 2015, I put a post on Facebook and I was floored with all of the parents in the U.S. who couldn't see their kids. And about half of the people contacting me were moms. And I think it's very important to say that parental alienation, even though moms are often awarded custody more. Parental alienation is not a gender issue. No, it's not. And the reason why people, because people often ask, why would somebody alienate the other parent? And, and as you saw in the film Racing Family, we're very careful not to diagnose from afar or to put reasons in people's heads other than what they say. What we do know is that in kind of the easier cases, it's for revenge. And I say easier because revenge is actually a rational response, an unhealthy response, but it's a rational response, or you're trying to get the child to get an upper hand to get more money or something. Right. Uh, so you can negotiate with these types of people because they are angry or they want something specific. But the cases where it's very difficult is when the person is repeating a pattern from childhood. So that this is what happened in their house. So they think this is normal. And often they They might be suffering from a personality disorder or some sort of mental illness, which again, I don't want to diagnose from afar. And there's a lot of stuff on narcissism, which I also warn people also, you can't just also say my ex is a narcissist, therefore they should never see the kids. So it's, it's a way (laughs) to understand the behaviors and to figure out a treatment plan. It's not, uh, well, this person, because they have a mental disorder is therefore evil incarnate. Because I also often see a lot of parents going that route. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the other thing when I started to create the Erasing Family documentary was kids began to reach out to me. Uh, One of the girls in the film was 12. She reached out to me. She sent me a message that I'm an erased sister. I can't see my brother. And all the other kids I found through social media. And it took a while to find people who were willing to share these very intimate stories on film. Mm -hmm. And that's why the film took a few years, a few years to make. And I really wanted to make it un, unsensational. That's not a word. I wanted to make it like <laughs> non-sensational. Yeah. Because, yeah, because you can focus on these very graphic cases. And I know of a lot of cases that have ended in the U.S. With, in very horrific, violent detail. And I chose to go around, which maybe means, you know, it gets less publicity, the film, but to really show the psychological damage that the kids suffer. And uh, I'm convinced that there's a lot of parents who are doing alienating behaviors who don't know what they're doing in the sense of that they can be reached by awareness and education, even simple things like saying, don't bad mouth the other parent, which all parents do this in divorce, unfortunately. But it, it it has to be limited. But that's something that can be taught. Because I think a lot of parents, unfortunately, think that the kids don't really take it seriously. 
or, and also the way that adults process information. So if you tell your friend, you know, my ex is a complete, you know, POS, you know, they might, they might sympathize, they might talk, they might think, you know, okay, you're angry. Kids take that as gospel. Right. And also you're talking about half of their DNA. Right. So their the message is they get is that I must be half bad too. I'm a piece of shit. Right. right. That's, that's yeah. literally what that, that is the message they absorb. Right. Is if, if my dad's a piece of shit, then I am too. Right. Exactly. So there must be something wrong with me. Maybe I'll turn out like him. Mm-hmm. So, so these things can be very damaging. And, you know, if you will take away one thing from the movie and the podcast, it's to really limit the bad mouthing as much as possible. That's why we have friends, psychologists, support groups. Uh, and it can be very hard, especially because a lot of parents say, well, I want the, my child to know. And children will always find out. They, and they have the right to have their own relationships yes, and to find out stuff on their own, mm-hmm. uh, but they don't need to know everything that's going on or, or be told certain things. And, and also, and I think this angers a lot of people, someone might be a very bad spouse and a great parent. Totally. But absolutely. Not, but, but that right. happens a lot, you know? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Absolutely. My ex is one of the greatest dads I've ever seen. He was a shitty husband, but to me, but like, oops, but that's, you know, like if I were to, you can't base how someone is as a parent on how they are as a, as a spouse. That's a, that's a, not an even playing field. And now we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. Today's sponsor is Soberlink. Now the Soberlink system is designed to make parenting time safer with real-time remote alcohol monitoring. Soberlink uniquely combines a breathalyzer with wireless connectivity and is the only system that includes facial recognition, tamper detection, and advanced reporting. Parents can submit a test anytime, anywhere, thanks to Soberlink's wireless technology, which delivers test results by text message or email to the concerned parties. Simplify co-parenting arrangements by using the system that provides transparency and proof of sobriety throughout the day. Flexible schedules combined with real-time delivery of results make Soberlink the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology. And for limited time, get $50 off your device by emailing info at soberlink.com and mentioning the Divorce Survival Guide. And now back to our show. Another interesting sort of aspect of alienation, right, is that it can actually happen, especially when you're talking with like personality disorders and mental illness, right, that it can actually happen. You can be emotionally alienated from a custodial parent, right? So because... If there's a if there's a parent with with mental disorders, and I don't want to say mental illness, but like mental disorders, especially personality disorders, and that kind of thing, they're more likely to make a parent make a child feel like they have to choose sides. Like any first of all, any time that we're asking a parent a, a child to choose sides, we are putting them in the middle and we're putting them in danger. Someone with a mental disorder, even if they don't have custody, a child then knows like, oh, but my love for the other parent is, you know, this is conditional. So I have to, right. They right. figure out what, who they have to ally with. Putting the child in a position, which our courts do of asking them to choose of picking a winner and a loser and being a custodial parent does not isolate you from the effects of parental alienation. I mean, technically you can be alienated in an intact married household. Yes. And a lot of people say that they saw the signs before the divorce. And uh, one person said something very, very telling when they were still married, his wife's mother died. And she said, well, if my mother's dead, then your mother should have no contact with the kids because that would be unfair. Wow. But that's so that's an example of an alienating behavior, cutting out (laughs) one half of the family. And, and these things, creepy. that's these just things like, a, like, how do you, how do you get to that? Like, you know what I mean? Like there's no logic there, obviously. Right. It's like, it's mind blowing. Yeah. So that's why it's so important that if this is, if this is identified when you're going through a divorce or a separation to really make sure that you have 
a visitation schedule that's super clear. I've seen too many people get warped up into like adequate time, necessary time. Uh, you have right of first refusal, which means that if the kid is going to go into daycare or be taking care of a babysitter, you have the right to have the child at that time. Mm-hmm. And then if things get rough to not escalate with the conflict, document everything. And then people who have these tendencies, they need very firm guidelines. And one thing that I see parents who are suffering from parental alienation do is they begin to negotiate by giving up time or their power. And my recommendation is as long as it's safe, and in some cases it isn't safe, the extreme cases, but as long as it's safe, never to give up any parenting time or going to events. And if that means your child sulks and doesn't talk to you uh, for the whole weekend or the whole week, you can deal with that. Yes, but keep They're showing up. You. If, they, if they don't, if they say don't go to the event, because I, I also was talking to to an alienated parent, and uh, he said that his son told him, "If you remarry, I will never talk to you again." So he decided not to remarry. And I asked him, "Well, how's your relationship with your son?" "Oh, we haven't talked in five years." So I was like, "We'll get married." Yeah, like you're having someone who controls your life but they're also not actually giving you that relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and they're also a PS, a child. <laughs> right? Correct. <laughs> but a lot of people hear, Oh, I was told not to go to the school event because it would stress them out. So I decided not to go. And I said, uh, well, how's your relationship? Oh, well, we, 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 we've never talked. So to show up, because then if you don't show up, what that confirms is the other parent was right. I'm not, I'm not loved. They don't care. They're not trying. I've been abandoned. That's what a lot of parents say after they prevent you from being able to see the kid. They then say, see, they never, never showed, showed up. up. Right. Uh, so, and, and that's, that's probably the most common way to do this is to prevent the other parent from showing up and then use that as proof to so move back into, into mom. So in the racing family documentary, There are quite a few different families from different socioeconomic and geographical statuses. And uh, two of the parents who are alienated are moms. And and, in one case, you know, she makes all the effort that she can to see her kids and she goes there and she's not allowed and we hear the recordings. And she begins to withdraw her presence and she eventually allows uh, the daughter to be adopted by the stepmom, believing it's the only way to make her happy. Well, uh, she's also alienated. Like she's told that the children don't want to see her. Right. right. So that's what, that's why she backs off. Right. Because the stepmother says like, they don't want to see you. They're not, they don't want you. And so she thinks she's doing the right thing. Right. Like she's like, Oh my God, my kids don't, I guess this is better for them or Another takeaway for your listeners, if if this is happening, when you do see your children, whatever opportunity you get to make it as fun as and light as possible, because having talked to her son, he said he he chose to stop seeing her because it was so stressful. There was so much fighting the exchanges, but then she would get into this, why don't you want to see me? You know, so it becomes this whole morose thing. Right. And and kids, especially teenagers, don't want to discuss their feelings. So I, I always advise parents to, even if it's just texting, never say, I miss you. Um, I'm heartbroken. I'm so sad. But just to like share fun stuff, even if it's nothing to do with the relationship, like mm. a funny video you saw, a funny TikTok, a photo of like a funny sign. And then it, you can also share like fun memories, like photos of like, oh, remember like five years ago, we... We sled in the snow. Here's a photo. Stuff like that, but not like, I'm always your mother, and I'll never stop being your mother, and I miss you, and I birthed you. Like a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure, right? Yeah, it's a lot of pressure Mm -hmm. for the kids. So so to keep it light, and any time that you have, even if it's a phone call or texting, to keep it to keep it light. That's really good advice, actually. I think that's really smart. That's really smart because it establishes yourself as a not stressful parent, (laughs) right? Even though like everything in you probably wants to like set the record straight 
and, you know, let them know that like, no, I showed up like 40 times or whatever, right? It's maybe actually not in the best interest of the children's mental health to do that. Right. There's something so great that you point out in the film that, you know, the court system always talks about what's in the best interest for children, but then literally never legally defines that. Right. So it's, you know, which how I don't know how they could, but because there's so many different, you know, variations on that, but they're constantly talking about it. And yet it's completely subjective. Judicial discretion is just another word for bias. <laughs> and a judge can be biased against mothers who work. A judge can be biased against fathers. A judge can be biased against certain racial groups, ethnicities, religions. And most in most cases, the judges don't have to justify the decisions they make. They can kind of decide anything and they have no training in child psychology. Well, most judges are not required to have any training. So any training that they do is optional. Mm -hmm. And this really creates a, a very weird system for deciding matters of, of children, having non-experts who have tons of cases on their dockets. We interviewed one judge in a racing family who said he had 2000 cases on his docket. And that was in Orange County, which is not a poor area of the U.S. Right. So uh, you can imagine what it is in other places. And they're making these snap judgments that affect an entire family. And then to throw something else in the mix in a lot of jurisdictions, kids as young as 12 can decide who they want to live with or whether to see a parent ever again. So they're, they're able to make these huge decisions. They don't really understand what's going on. They feel incredible pressure. There's a lot of kids who talk in the film about this pressure to testify, to say things before a judge, and then feel really guilty afterwards. And, and lie. And, and lie. actually lie, right? Yeah, to, to right. make the, the parent happy who's sitting in the courtroom right there. Yeah, so that's why a lot of people who know a lot about child psychology say that a child should never be asked who they want to live with. They shouldn't be brought in to testify. They should not be in those courtrooms. They shouldn't be anywhere near the courtrooms. I've been in, oh, I've, you know, if anyone's ever had the, you know, quote, pleasure of sitting in on, you know, is sitting in family court or dependency court. And, you know, I have, I have had the experience of, of one judge saying, we need to remove the child before any of these proceedings continue. And then the next time we were in court, different judge, same kid had to sit there and listen to the whole proceeding. And it's devastating, utterly devastating. They should not be anywhere near it. And you said that the film made you angry. How did, how did the film make you angry? <laughs> it did make me angry. Well, I mean, look, what makes me angry is the financial aspect of all of this that, you know, the family court system is a how many billion dollar industry? <laughs> So, so the family court is estimated to be a $50 billion a year industry. $50 billion a year. And there is no right to an attorney. This is the, something I actually did not know until I watched the film, That you, which, of course, I do know thinking about it, but I hadn't really thought about it in this way, that like in a criminal court, you have a right to an attorney. So if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. Those are That's your Miranda rights. And in the in family law, that is not the case. So you either represent yourself and you probably don't have a whole lot of information about how the family law system works, which, by the way, is can be super complicated or you got to pay through the fucking nose. And if you can't pay through the nose, then, you know, you're on the losing. You're probably on the losing side of this. So that's what made me mad. That part. Yeah, so we spent all this money on family court and legal fees, filing fees. I remember talking to one dad who told me that every time he had to file any piece of paper in family court in New York, it was $100. Right, right. So anytime he couldn't see his kids and had to go to court to file paperwork saying that he couldn't see his kids, just right there, that was $100, not even talking about anything else. And there's, there's no legal aid. Because right. people always say, oh, we'll go to the law clinic or something. They don't want to deal with family law cases. And I think and it depends on the jurisdiction, but 60 to 70% of people in family court are pro se. And so what does that mean? So, so pro se means, so 50 to 60% of people in family court, depending on the jurisdiction, represent themselves. 
which is often referred to as pro se. So to me, like the grand irony is that a lot of law school graduates have problem finding work, but we have a huge mass of people who don't have lawyers, which I have to say the solution is not necessarily more lawyers. It is that the family court should not exist. And after having worked in this space for so long, I'm an abolitionist, and, and it's a term that's become in vogue with criminal court about people who want to abolish the prison system. Mm-hmm. And I don't see how family court is the proper venue for to decide custody. I don't see how family court is the correct venue to decide custody of children. Court might work quite well for not paying a contract, bounce checks, but when there's matters of emotions and and civility, an adversarial nature is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Is how do you co-parent after you say the worst things that you can about the other side? How do you walk out of the courtroom as friends? Exactly. And it makes, and that's, I think the telltale sign of cases of alienation is that the tensions will rise post-divorce. So in most divorces, I mean, you're always getting divorced for a reason. Right. And in most divorces, after the papers are signed and there's some tense period afterwards, things should get better. Mm. Maybe not as rosy as we want, but they should get better. Mm -hmm. And in these high conflict cases and cases of parental alienation, we see the opposite. Things will get worse as time progresses. Yes. There'll be more yelling, more fighting, more hurt feelings, and they don't resolve naturally. So it's so important for people in the beginning of the process. And I think we have to reach people in the beginning before these behaviors really start to traumatize children and do long-term damage is to stay out of family court. And I know probably your listeners have heard of mediation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My suggestion would be (laughs) if you go mediation, make sure it's a mediator. Uh, If you're dealing with a potential case of parental alienation, you know that there's a lot of issues there. A, medi- a mediator who is trained and how to deal with these types of cases, who just doesn't say work it out amongst yourselves no. and just to like record what you would agree on, but who really can, you know, lead both sides to an agreement. And then another thing that we didn't show in the film, but I think is very interesting is something called collaborative law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And collaborative law is when both sides are represented by an attorney but there's an agreement that they can't go to trial. So you'd actually have to fire the attorneys and start all over if you go to trial. So the lawyers have an interest in settling, but the idea is to make it a friendly process. But this is a great thing if, if you think like mediation is might be too soft for what you're dealing with, mm-hmm. but you want to avoid the court, collaborative law, you can see some great results. And yeah. in general, they try to resolve within four days. Whereas yeah. a trial, I mean... It could go on for months, years, years, you have to get a court date. years. I think one of the things that was really interesting, there was a, um, I think that was one of the judges in the film that says that, you know, when you mediate or, and I think the same can be said for collaborative, uh, the collaborative process, um, everyone has sort of buy-in about the result. So, you know, people compromise and you don't, you know, not everybody wins and, you know, people, you know, you win some, you lose some and you kind of come out the other side, but everyone has, has a buy-in with that result. But in litigation, you're coming out the other end and someone doesn't have any buy-in. And so they're not incentivized to comply, right? right? They're more incentivized to refile to find some reason to go ex parte to something to start, you know, this ball rolling again Mm -hmm. down the line. And, you know, the other thing that made me so mad is about, you know, so the, so let's, well, let's talk about shared parenting. Let's, let's start Mm -hmm. talking about why shared parenting is so important and why it's having so much trouble (laughs) being passed in various states, is it is it state? Is it a state issue? Yeah, or is so it it's, county? State, it's state by state. So shared parenting, which a lot of people might know better as uh, joint physical custody. So it's equal or near equal timeshare. A lot of people say 50-50, but technically anything above 70-30 
is considered shared parenting. What people are trying to get the law to say is that shared parenting should be the default, which means that's the starting point. And unless there is domestic, physical, sexual abuse, it, you start off with shared parenting. Now the parents can agree to something different, science for geography or variety of reasons that won't work, but that the judge isn't automatically going to decide that one parent gets the cus- gets custody and the other doesn't. Mm-hmm. Now there's only two states in the U.S. that have this. Well, technically one, which is Kentucky, and they have a default shared parenting law, which has been quite successful. Divorce filings have gone down. Incidents of domestic violence have gone down after the law has been passed. Really? Well, if you think about it, huh. conflict yeah. creates violence. So right. you have less conflict and people There's can less kids. Yeah. Right. And then the other state is Arizona, which doesn't have a default shared parenting written into the law with those words. What it has is that judges must maximize parenting time with each parent, which is essentially works out to be the same. Research shows this is the best for kids. Kids, when they're polled as young adults, wish they had more time with each parent. And we have polling data that just came out from the National Parents Organization that shows it polls in in different states, always higher than 91% of the population supporting this. In Florida, for example, is 99% support, which is incredibly high Mm -hmm. for anything. That's crazy high. So why on earth is only Kentucky the state that has shared parenting? And these laws... People have been trying to pass these laws now for 20, 30 years. And that's because there's a lot of money in divorce. Mm-hmm. And there's a special interest group called the, you know, the, the state bar association, the family lawyers who say, well, and this is true. If people agree to this, they can have it. The problem is that when the cases don't agree, there's a huge incentive to fight for custody. So what we're seeing in state legislatures is this legislation being blocked by special interests because lawyers make money the more hours they bill. So the Bar Association, right, Mm -hmm. is has been coming in to block this bill because they don't because they want to litigate. Right. Because there's 50 billion dollars a year in this litigation. The lawyers are blocking the shared parenting bills and they're, they're also just spreading a lot of misinformation that you need a judge to look at each case and decide how each case is different and have all these parameters But when we look at child support, the state has very clear guidelines on what you're supposed to pay for child support. And there's no special circumstances with child support. Right. Right. Interesting. And child support can be decided before anything else is decided. And child support is not related to visitation. Child support gives another incentive to fight for custody. Mm -hmm. Because you're right. In most jurisdictions, and what makes this confusing is each state is a little different. So, you know, uh, read the fine print of your state. Right, exactly. You're absolutely correct. The more time you have with your child, the more child support you get. This creates a huge incentive to fight for parenting time. Uh, You know, like I've talked to people who said, you know, my ex-wife said she's fighting for sole custody because it's a financial decision and she calculated how much more money she would get, especially in states where there isn't alimony or spousal support. Mm -hmm. And... But what I meant by it's not connected to visitation is a lot of parents say, well, I pay child support, but I can't see my kids. Now, the law has no provision that if you keep the kid from the other parent, that you lose out on your child support. Right. And so you had in the film, there's a dad who had not seen his daughter, his kids in his two daughters in like over 10 years. And he was paying child support <laughs> every month. Right. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I mean, I, and I and I and I I actually personally go back and forth on this. Like, if you're not allowed to see, if you're not allowed to see them, or especially in alienation, I was sort of pissed off that he was had to pay <laughs> all that child support, right? Yeah. But then, if it's somebody else and something different, and they abdicate or they move far away, like, yeah, they fucking have to pay, right? So, like, so there is this idea of it being, I guess, like a, a standard. And without taking into account special circumstances, I mean, for me, that gets really gray. It, it is very complicated. I think also the other issue is that it's based on percent of income. Uh-huh. And so that's why when you hear these cases of celebrities in the news who are paying millions of dollars in child support. 
On the flip side, it also means that there's parents who don't get the support that they need because the other parent doesn't make enough money. And most parents who are in jail for non-payment are there because they're broke. Um, we explore that in the film, you know, they're not deadbeats, they're dead broke. Because the basic reason why we have child support isn't to support children. It's so that the state doesn't have to take care of children. That was the original invention. And it was meant to replace the welfare system, but nobody kind of thought poor people tend to marry poor people. So you have, you're trying to do an income transfer from people who are earning minimum wage to people who aren't working. Yeah. And then of course they can't pay. And so then they wind up in jail. So the whole thing is just very crazy. And I think, you know, and this is beyond the scope of the film or racing family, but there's been talk about, uh, you know, universal basic income or child credits that I think could help a lot of families who are struggling because also then sometimes the child support award is like very small if it's based on percentage of income. Right. It could be $80 a month. Right. You know, right. for child support, which then someone still can't pay. So and then they end up in jail. Uh, what, there, were some, there were some horrifying statistics um, in the film. I don't know if you know them off the top of your head about the percentage of or the number of people who are in jail, incarcerated due to non-payment of child support, like incarcerated. Yes. So again, you don't have a right to an attorney because it's a contempt of civil court charge. So when you're, you're put in jail, not prison for contempt of court, but that could be up to six months. And of course, when you're put in jail, you lose your job. Your child support debt accrues while you're in jail. Uh, you can't get a job when you get out because you've been incarcerated and nobody wants to hire incarcerated people. And also the taxpayer is paying a ton of money to incarcerate someone. So the system basically makes no sense. You can also lose your driver's license, your passport, your professional license. So if you can't pay child support, you can't drive to work. If you uh, are a doctor, or a hairdresser, you can't work because you lose your professional license. Mm. So I, the system in, was designed thinking of this image of a divorced father who abandons his family, gets a sports car, marries the mistress, right. and is living it up and not caring if the kids are starving on the streets. And that is not what's going on. Most men who I talk to are divorced are devastated financially and emotionally. Well, women are the ones who initiate most of the divorces. Yeah, 69% are initiated by women. Right. And a lot of men who I've talked to, even if they weren't terribly happy, they weren't really into the idea of getting divorced is what I found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. And so they're not, they're not happy about this. Uh, I don't want to say that no one is buying a sports car, but that's not, <laughs> that's not the reality for most people. Cause I, really yeah. when you look at the divorce system, it was like, it was designed for upper, upper middle-class people who had resources, assets to fight over, who could pay for lawyers. It was never designed for a couple where one person is making 20 K a year and the other is making 30 K a year. Right. That's not what this was designed for. <laughs> And then there's something else in the in the film where you where you talk about actually like where's the money going? Because if you're paying child support into the system, like if you're if you have to pay to the system and you're not just paying directly to the spouse, right? <clears throat> the spouse ends up the ex the ex does not or the other parent actually doesn't get all that money. Right? There's a because, yeah, there's the a hole takes, there. Right. So the state takes off fees, which can mm -hmm. be quite high. They might charge interest, which in a lot of states, the interest doesn't go to the parent who is owed that. I, it was interesting because, so there's one story in the film where the dad has this huge child support debt of about 30,000 and he doesn't make a lot of income. So 30,000 to him is a huge amount of money. Right. And he's talking about all that he has to do to pay this, how he's been arrested for non-payment, how he's lost his driver's license. And, but the worst part is, that it's not going to his daughters, but it doesn't mean that it's because my ex is spending it. It's mm -hmm. not going to anybody. It's going to the state coffers because it's overdue. And then when I finally sit down with the mother, she said she had no idea that he was paying because she never saw any of it. Wow. It never even got to her. No, because I mean, when he says in the, right. this, this goes to the state. Yeah. He bad. means it goes to the state. Yeah. Yeah. And oh. she never saw it because it was overdue interest. 
Oh, and, right. I see. Yeah, if it's he's interest, the interest. Yeah, right. Right. And also, the interest compounds so highly. I think his original debt was maybe one or two thousand dollars, and it balloons up to thirty thousand. Yeah, it's and like then, a payday loan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, it's insane. So it's it's just something where it's kind of a good good intentions, but unintended consequences designed for a different world that we live in now where both parents tend to work, where we are dealing with a lot of divorce with people who don't have assets. We're also dealing with a lot of child support cases of never married parents. 26% of children in the US are not living in married households. And trying to decide custody and child support with between two strangers is very difficult. <laughs> and that's what I heard is like kind of the storm that's coming is people having kids without outside of relationships. Right. And then the dad wants visitation. And I know most of your listeners are women, but for any men out there, shocking fact, if you are not married, you have no rights to your child in this country. And you actually have to prove paternity, right? You don't have to prove maternity, but if you want to have if you, if you go to court or whatever, they'll call you the presumed father. And as long as nobody contests that, you're fine. But you actually have to pr- pr- prove your paternity by like, you know, turning in documents or whatever, or taking a DNA test. Right. So if you are, if you're an unmarried father, like, yeah, I was talking to a dad and he was like, because he was living with a mom. He like had no idea that he had no rights it's, it's, at all. Yeah. Uh, because you're just seen as, and, and in this, the U S is very behind other, other countries. Yeah. You, you have a great, <laughs> I love that you put in the Swedish system in the film. It, it's just, it's so remarkable. You see this Swedish couple and they're just like sitting in their kitchen or their living room with a piece of paper. And they're like, okay, you sign this, you sign this. Cool. We're done. And it's like, we, we could never. Right. I mean, I suppose we could, but so much would have to change to make that possible. Right. Well, there's just an assumption in Sweden that you don't go to court. Right. So that doesn't mean that there's no cases of parental alienation in Sweden. There are. Hmm. But most people never see the inside of a courtroom and they never hire a lawyer. And also child support is determined on the needs of of the child, not on not based on income. And I forget exactly how they do it, but basically you pay for the child when they're in your care. So it's much more equitable. Hmm. Uh, and, and kind of the state sets a, a, a level that must be met, but it's, it's like about 400 euros, which would be like $600 a month per child. Right. So right. that's, so you can't be paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in child support. But, but just there's also a cultural message. So what's interesting in Sweden is Sweden does not have default shared parenting. Hmm. But there's a social stigma if you don't share custody. Hmm. And it's just assumed that you will get along after divorce for the kid's sake. So people don't like the whole lawyer up, destroy them. They're like, you got into this mess. You, you, you know, you deal with your ex. Yeah. Figure it out. Be grownups and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that the U S we would have that too, if it weren't for the family law system. Exactly. I mean, if it was not for an ad, a system that sets up this, you know, systems of, of being adversarial, we would probably have the same expectation too, because that's what makes sense. Right, exactly. <laughs> I want to say this that I think it's a I think it's a really it's a great film. I think it's an important film for people to watch um, who are going through this process because it really kind of shows you where the pitfalls are. And I like that you know you definitely have some extreme cases, but then you go right into you show that there are also ways in which that you can get sucked into you know inadvertent. Yeah. Um, alienation that are not very, not these extreme cases. I think it's important for people to watch the film and to see if they recognize anything and they might recognize that they're doing some of these alienating behaviors. So one of the people with good news is that we all suffer trauma, but by removing the thing that traumatizes us, which if it's a kid access to both parents, therapy, coping skills, 
it's not a death sentence. It's not a life sentence to suffering that this, these things can be overcome. And if people are participating in these alienating behaviors, they can stop, they can get help. They can talk to a therapist about how to not unload these negative emotions on their kid. And also if someone is alienated right now, who's listening to this, the film has happy endings and reunification is possible. And I always tell parents, don't think about the days you can't see your kid. Think about the days until you see them and prepare for that day so that you're healthy, happy, and strong. Because a lot of times the, the reuniting comes at an unexpected moment. In the film, one of the main characters, she shows up at her dad's salon randomly one day. Right. And if you're still angry and hurt and destroyed and broken on that day, that reunification might be very short-lived. And I think people, they put so much emphasis on what it's going to be like when we finally see each other. They don't think about what comes next. And it also, you're asking your child who's been taught so many awful things about you to take a huge leap of faith. So you need to really be able to show up. Yes. So self-care is utterly important. And another thing that a lot of people listening to this might get out of the film is I'm assuming that your listeners who are now moms at one point were kids. Mm. And if statistic bears out, half of them are the children of divorce. Mm-hmm. Maybe more because people who grow up with divorce are more likely to divorce. And it's possible that they have some unhealed issues with their parents. And if they watch the film or share it with people who they know have unhealed issues with parents who maybe aren't talking to one, the film really is designed to help young adults heal, to give them that aha moment, to understand that their parents maybe made some bad choices, but the system was not helping them. And that the best thing you can do is forgive, um, accept your parents for what they are, which might be that they're very limited. I always say you can love your parents, you can hate your parents, but don't erase them, which means that sometimes relationships are messy. Sometimes they're not happy. Sometimes you have to put limits. But what we need to avoid is that's not my mom. My stepmom is my mom. That's not my dad. That's my sperm donor. And I'm very happy with my father figure. That's what we need to avoid because that is a form of psychosis and it's very damaging for children because especially if that, if that other parent has negative traits, which everybody has negative traits, newsflash, <laughs> they will not, uh, they will keep on repeating those negative traits until they see them and deal with them. Um, I mean, I spent years where I didn't talk to my dad and my dad, he's passed on not a generous person, Mm. not a generous person with time, not a generous person with money. And I now am a generous person, but that's only after I reunited with him and said, gosh, I don't want to end up like him, not generous. You know, like I need to, I need to start helping out my friends when they ask and like donating money and like, you know, being there. And if people want to watch this film, the easiest thing to do is to go to our website, erasingfamily.org. And there you will have all the links to all the platforms. So the film Erasing Family is on iTunes, Google, Play, Amazon, Vimeo. It's free to stream on Tubi, which is a new platform. And Tubi works with Roku. So if you have a Roku or smart TV, Tubi will work. And it's also free to stream on YouTube. So what I really want to ask people to do, they watch the film and they like it. And right now it has a 9.6 on IMDb. So it's not just us who, who, are, who think it's, it's good. People are really responding to it, but not That's a lot great. of people are finding it because we don't have a huge marketing campaign behind us is to share the film, not just on your social media, but to actually share it in a direct message, an email or text to somebody. And especially if you think they could use the film or they're a young person, my advice, because people always say, well, how do I share with my kid or this person is to say, hey, I found this film. Love to hear your opinion, period. Don't say, I think this film can help you. This film is about me. This film is about parental alienation. Here's a link to all the studies on parental alienation, just because people love to get their opinion. <laughs> yeah. So it's a great way to engage people to say, I love to hear your opinion. Mm-hmm. And then stop. It's a film. And the films are meant to be light. And I always say you need to share this the same way you would share the Tiger King and not make a big deal out of it. You make a big deal out of it, people won't watch it. 
Right. It's true. You know? It's it's true. Listen, I am like a crime, you know, a, a dateline crime junkie, right? And this is this is sort of in a sense, I sat down to watch it and I was like, oh, it's kind of like I'm watching an episode of Dateline. Like it's a investigative journalism mm -hmm. film, documentary film about this subject, which is not to say that it's like Dateline, but it it's not like it's the kind of film that I think everyone should watch and can watch. It's consumable by by the masses. If people are scared, it has high production values. It's not, it's, it's you know, it wasn't filmed with an iPhone. We filmed in like 10 locations, but- Oh yeah, we, it's beautifully shot. We beautifully really shot. tested it on teenagers a lot mm -hmm. to make sure that they would respond to it, that they would like it and they would get the takeaways from it. There's so many people out there who haven't healed. It always pains me when somebody says, I just realized I'm an alienated child and I'm 72. Or they say, I wasn't able to reunite and now my parents are no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it's very important not just to say, well, these things naturally heal. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. In the film, we have people who at 18 reached out, but people who took a lot longer. And then siblings who still haven't reached out. Society needs to start sending a message that kids have the right to form a relationship with their family members, siblings and parents included that can't be interfered with, they shouldn't be put in the middle. And in the film, Ashlyn, the main character, she reunites because her boyfriend says, you should talk to your dad, what's the worst thing that happens? You st he stays out of your life, or maybe you'll find something great. And that's the message we need to start giving kids going through divorce. And also, if you have a friend who's like, I'm gonna lawyer up and destroy him or her, to step in and say, hey, that's really not the best thing. I know you're very angry right now. Uh, yeah. Let's go throw some axes. I, I've seen those axe throwing things, you know, like whatever Rage it rooms, is. rage rooms, but, go to a rage room. <laughs> but uh, it's much cheaper than a lawyer. And there's nothing worse than seeing your kid's college fund and all the equity in your house. And it can happen. So take that as a warning. Just because you're a millionaire now, if you're listening to this, doesn't mean you'll be a millionaire at the end of the divorce. Yes. So stay, stay out of court, stay out of court, stay out of court. Uh, it's nicer to split that money than give it to a lawyer. Ain't that the truth? Thank you so much. Thank you for the film and thank you for coming on and talking about it. Everybody go watch this film. It's super important. It is Erasing Family and it's at erasingfamily.org. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.